people about the, the state guidance that even though AAP and CDC say mask over two, that in our state, um, if you're under six, um, a mask isn't recommended. And so some parents have said, hey, I tried to send my four-year-old with a, a mask and the daycare said no. Um, I'm guessing that's just the practicality of keeping a mask on a toddler potentially all day long and um, the, the teacher might be handling a lot of wet yucky mask all day long. Yeah it, it, and I, I think the intention um, with that document and I'm just speculating here because I did not write the document but um, my interpretation and the guidance that we've continued to provide schools is like we know like we're not going to come into a class and you know find them because they have a three-year-old that isn't wearing a mask because you can't keep it on their face, but we have encouraged that they continue to encourage mask wearing and it may not be really something you can truly mandate, but we have definitely not said that it is not recommended locally. So we've tried to continue to push that message that I know that it's difficult, but the more of these children can wear masks, it probably is going to help reduce the spread. And we know that there's kids that won't be able to, um, but we'll try the best you can. And I've been um, surprised to hear a lot of teachers say that they're very impressed with the way kids can actually wear the mask and they're doing better maybe than the teachers are. So it was pretty interesting to hear some of those comments. So let's let's move on and talk about if I can get this to move forward. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Let's let's talk about schools. Um, so this paper uh, was published um, just recently. Um, it looked at what happened in one community in Germany um, when schools reopened. So on the left hand side, um, you see the um, epi curve um, of cases. Um, schools reopened in May, were open all summer, and then they shut down for summer holiday, um, really at the end of July, beginning of August. Um, and if you look on the, the right hand um, side, they looked at um, sources of COVID-19 infection in children. Um, even though schools were open, um, there were really very few cases um, where a child was infected by another child. Um, and so this seems uh, like good news um, for schools reopening. Thoughts about, about this? Yeah, I think um, this doesn't look that different than our experience. I think some things I just kind of, as I took a look at this article, really looked at some of the differences maybe between us and this community to try to put things a little bit in perspective. And I think, you know, the schools that have opened here, we've really had, um, you know, relatively high case um, uh, incidents right here as schools have opened. And the good thing is, is that even with that, um, we have not seen any signs of within school transmission. Um, we have had a lot of situations where we've had to quarantine a reasonable amount of students or teachers um, because of exposures, um, but those exposures really seem to be predominantly household contacts and then sports have been a major um, contributor to the number of cases and children that are returning to school. Those sports at this point really have been more so like club sports, not necessarily school sports, as school sports and high schools open. Um, I think we've seen some cases there, but um, but the schools I think are really trying to do a good job with all the preventive measures that they can. So, um, and I know we do have some experience. Um, the Archdiocese in Louisville has been working really hard to keep their schools open. And I think they've, um, found that it was a little bit challenging, especially the first few weeks as they had cases that were identified um, and learning the contact tracing process and trying to figure out who needs to be quarantined and who needs to, um, who, how long people need to stay out of school. And we've tried to help work, help them work through that. And I think after that initial um, chaos that um, would make sense anywhere, just because it's a new thing for people to do, I think they're feeling more confident that 
the measures that they're putting into place, wearing masks, getting the kids socially distanced, uh, cohorting kids as much as possible to reduce those exposures within the school, outdoor activities to try to help improve ventilation, um, even things like keeping windows open in the classrooms to help increase ventilation, hand washing, um, wearing masks um, during the day, those things I think they're really starting to understand that those measures actually work. Um, and the other interesting thing I think with this German article is that they weren't necessarily wearing masks um, and they didn't necessarily have kids socially distanced. So, um, and they felt like the implementing those measures might make, um, you know, opening full in-person school uh, more realistic. And I think that seems to be the experience we've had so far. Um, I'm, it's still pretty early. We've only been at this for um, about a month now, but, um, but I definitely, it's, it's definitely interesting to see how effective those measures can be. So Catholic schools are open um, and some private schools are open, but Jefferson County is getting ready. Um, do, do you want to talk about um, this document from the state health department and, and how we'll use this to decide if schools can stay open? Definitely. So there's two documents. So this document, the state health department released um, trying to help provide guidance for how, what types of instructions seem to be the most um, pertinent and, and um, safe, I guess, um, depending on how prevalent COVID is in the community. And if you look at the very top, this is including a state positivity rate of less than 6%. So positivity rate's a little tricky because it depends on how many positive uh, tests out of how many tests are done. And so depending on who's getting tested and whether they're sick or not, and many other factors, that positivity rate is not always the best number to go by. But then they also broke it down. You see under the color um, words, um, how many cases per 100,000 people, and that's an average daily number. So you'll see the orange. I mentioned the orange at the very beginning. Um, that you know we're right now in the orange at about 18 cases per 100,000 people on average daily and so really making sure that the schools are following these specific guidance um, if we're in that area as far as um, as far as incidence rates go we interestingly we started um, the school started really in that red zone um, and we've still seen the case numbers decline. So that's a positive thing. And I think the, the biggest things that the state recognizes is that there's a lot that goes into why kids need school and we want to try to provide in-person opportunities to the kids that need it most. Um, and so trying to create an environment that the educators feel is safe um, for those students to come back and for their staff to come back is really important. Um, the CDC has similar guidance that talks about a positivity rate and an incidence rate. And then they also have a portion in their um, recommendations that talk about the mitigation measures that the schools are implementing and how well they're doing that. So, um, so basically, if schools are implementing social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing, um, and really and trying to do all those healthy at school and healthy at work things that we've been talking about for months now, uh, if they're doing those to absolute fidelity, that's going to decrease the risk substantially with kids returning to school. And then I think the other thing the CDC has done very well, and I'm hoping that a lot of parents and families have accessed this document, but they um, put on their website a family decision-making document about whether or not it's a good choice for you to send your child back to school. And there's so many factors involved in that from, you know, the parent has to work in order to make an income to put food on the table and a roof over the he their head to, um, is there someone in the household with a medical problem that if this child does get exposed, that that could be detrimental to that family member. So that, that um, guidance from the CDC is really, I think, helpful 
Um, and I've encouraged schools to share that with parents and families who are struggling to make the decision on whether or not they would want to send their kid back to in-person school or whether they don't feel comfortable with that and kind of being able to know that they're making those decisions based off of all of the factors that they should be thinking of and not just one or two. So, and some of those factors include, you know, how much does this child need to be in person to learn and that that learning impacts them for the rest of their life, potentially, depending on the age that they are and how well they can learn by non-traditional methods. Yeah, it, it's a tough decision. And I suspect that even families who are really committed to in-person learning um, might be nervous um, and wonder, so, okay, now that we're open, how are, how are things going? Um, I, I heard about about this report on the, the state call earlier this week. Um, so there's a state webpage um, where K through 12 schools will report their own data. Um, and this should be readily available to the public, right? Correct. And I think the state is trying to transition to where the schools directly report, basically this data will go into the database that will show up on the website. What happens now is they report to us, we report to the state. And so this, that document that this right here, you'll see um, these numbers. And I think we have a hundred calls a day from media and different schools saying, that's not right. Those numbers are wrong. And, um, and it's just because there's a delay in that. So these numbers should be more accurate um, in coming days. Um, I know IT always takes a few um, weeks to smooth out the kinks when they first start things like this. So I would guess that there might be some um, you know, I might wait a few weeks before you really rely on this for any sort of uh, uh, factual information, but hopefully, um, I think we've done a similar, the state's done similar reporting with long-term care facilities, um, and so hopefully um, the process won't take too long to, to work out. And then we are trying to work locally to create a database um, that schools can report into so that we have more tangible local data and aren't waiting for that data to come back from the state so we can help the local facilities make more um, in time, uh, real time decisions um, about closures or other things. Um, and then our hope is that that database will be able to feed into the state's reporting to help reduce the workload on everyone. Um, duplicate reporting is a painful part of, uh, of uh, disease surveillance. And so whenever we can take those extra steps out, it always makes people a lot more willing to comply, so. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for that. I suspect people are squinting at their computer screens, trying to scroll down to um, the Diocese of Louisville and looking at the number of cases. Um, I, I, I just wanna emphasize that what I think is correct, that when we say there have been 82 cases, that's not to say 82 cases of kids who were infected at school just in school attendees who were ultimately diagnosed. Correct, and you'll see like JCPS has cases, they haven't even been in school yet, but we're still counting those just to have an idea of the number of people who are from that facility who have had cases. And um, I think for us within the health department, we look, I mean, we look grade by grade, classroom by classroom, case by case to see if there's transmission within a classroom. So we get down super granular and this is just a very big picture number. And I think the goal for us to have individual school reporting is so that we can break that down by school. And so if we see one school that's way off the charts, we're gonna have to look at them in particular and say, what are they doing here? that's not going so well and, and really focus our efforts on prevention in, in, in that location, so. So, you know, as I look at these, if we look over at the far right, the number of deaths, um, no deaths, and so that's really encouraging. Um, you sent me this article that was really just published in the MMWR that looked at COVID-19 associated deaths um, in, in children, at least those less than 21 years of age. What, what do you want our audience to take from this today? Yeah, I think the biggest things is that we have not seen a lot of deaths in younger individuals. The deaths that we have seen have been in 
what seemed to be relatively young, like infant age and then older, um, like older adolescents. But I also want to point out that I think a large, large um, proportion of those who have been impacted by deaths have been those who are also impacted by social determinants of health that we see every day in our clinic. So um, I think 70 or 75 percent of the cases were in um, Hispanic um, Hispanic populations and non-Hispanic Black populations, as well as like Native Americans um, or Alaskan Natives. And so, just you know, reiterating, I know you all know this. You see it every day in your clinics. But um, the children who have you know parents who are essential workers who aren't protected by family medical leave laws and have to go to work every day, children who live in um, crowded settings, um, children who are already at educational um, and health related disadvantages, um, those are the ones who are being the most impacted by, um, by death and then I would even say by severity of disease as well. And so um, we have really tried to focus our testing efforts and opportunities and tried to focus some efforts on education in some of those communities here in Louisville. And I think we've seen some lower numbers of cases in general compared to some places elsewhere in this, in this um, country. But, um, but I think that that's really important to point out so people are aware. You know, when, when I saw this, I thought, um, wow, the, the number of deaths that we've had thus far among kids from COVID-19 really approaches the number of deaths in kids that we have from flu every year. Um, and so, you know, early on, the message was kids aren't as affected as adults, kids don't get very sick. Um, and so I think this is data that, well, some kids get very sick um, and there are kids who are dying. And um, again, not, not a lot, not most, um, but we look at these numbers with flu and we say, this is important, we need to prevent this. Um, the, the other thing that I thought was striking from this were the out of hospital deaths. So um, what, 35-ish um, percent of the deaths occurred out of hospital. Um, and, you know, we, I think we think about young children who um, get a respiratory infection and um, die at home, but, but some of these deaths, as you see, were in teenagers, um, and, and so there just wasn't a realization that they were sick, I think. Yeah, and I think, um, and, you know, to me, are those kids who are maybe being left at home because they're old enough to stay alone and they're sicker than their parents realize? It's hard to really know for sure. Um, and I think they're going to be focusing on trying to figure that out. And then the other thing that struck me too, kind of in association with this, is how quickly kids seem to get sick. So from the onset of symptoms to death was pretty quick. And um, and I feel like on, in a gestalt that with adults, it tends to be much longer, a, a more protracted um, situation where it might be several weeks after they first develop symptoms that, you know, they're in the ICU, but for kids, it's a lot quicker decline, it seems like. Well, and, and we should probably point out that I think this report lumped acute COVID and uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Um, and we were, we're learning a lot more about myocarditis after COVID and myocarditis in children. Um, so I'm hoping future, future papers will tease that out. Um, you know, I, I wonder if we should talk for just a minute about the, these recommendations from the KMA Committee on Sports Medicine, um, recognizing that um, myocarditis after COVID-19 is a real thing. It's a real thing in children. So, um, you, you know, I think we can all appreciate that if you have severe symptoms, um, that you need to be um, potentially have some cardiac evaluation by a care doctor or if, if it's thought to be best by a cardiologist. Um, but, but I was struck by the, the uh, left-hand column, asymptomatic since laboratory diagnosis. Um, no exercise for 14 days after positive test, medical evaluation that includes a thorough symptom screen focusing on um, signs that might 
might point to cardiac or systemic illness, um, and then considering an EKG, an echocardiogram, and a troponin. Yeah. And I think, I mean, to me, part of this is we don't know what, right? Like, is it symptomatic, asymptomatic? Is it, you know, I think as we learn more, we'll be able to probably have more precise recommendations here. But I think as with all things COVID, right, the more data we get, the better able we are to predict who might be impacted. And um, I know if it was my kid, I would certainly want to make sure he's safe to return to sports and, um, and, you know, a few weeks of waiting to return to sports is definitely worthwhile if it can uh, prevent, uh, a prevent a death or a severe outcome, so. You know, um, the AAP just within the last week or so published a paper about return to sports. Um, and I just summarized a couple of paragraphs on this slide. Um, the, the audience will see at the top. Um, the AAP says that if you have a severe presentation with any of those, those things listed there or MISC, then um, patients um, should be considered to have myocarditis and they're restricted from exercise and participation in sports for three to six months. If you have moderate symptoms, you need to be asymptomatic for at least 14 days and be cleared by your doctor. And then the next paragraph that I didn't put on the slide talked about exposure to somebody with COVID-19. No sports for 14 days to be on the safe side. Um, so, I, you know, I, I suspect this will change our practice um, and will, um, uh, uh, potentially, um, pediatricians and family physicians who are seeing kids will want to look at these and decide if they need to make any, any practice changes in their counseling. Um, um, the, the other thing I should mention is that our um, cardiology group led by Dr. Holland is um, uh, obviously um, able to assist. We have a multidisciplinary clinic for kids with MISC. Um, and some ha may have seen on the news that Norton Healthcare started a, um, a clinic for adults um, who have long-term sequelae from COVID. Um, if, if adults are still having symptoms, um, at 14 days, they uh, come to this clinic and they get triaged. Um, in adults, we're seeing not just cardiac symptoms, but chronic pulmonary symptoms. We're seeing um, worsening of mental health. We're seeing some neurologic symptoms. But there, there have been a number of papers in adults about these long-term symptoms and not a lot in kids. So I will say that we are uh, really working to develop um, a, a, uh, a clinic um, for kids who have long-term symptoms of COVID, but those have not been as well defined. All right, so there's been a lot of confusion, I think, about this, who should get tested for COVID. Um, uh, maybe some um, confusing advice from the CDC. So Dr. Kaloya, you wanna set the record straight and tell us at least in Jefferson County, who should get tested? Sure, we've tried to be as consistent as we can be locally from the very beginning. And um, I'll talk a little bit about a few things that have added some confusion in there, but certainly anybody with symptoms of COVID-19, I know you listed all of these here, those individuals definitely should be tested. If they have a contact and they have symptoms, someone who they've been around with COVID, that would be our number one priority would be um, contact, symptomatic contacts of cases with COVID, <clears throat> and then people with symptoms who maybe don't have a known contact. Um, and then other um, individuals that might be asymptomatic um, would be those who have a recent exposure. I think there's a lot of confusion around this. Um, as far as we, you can test someone if they've been a contact of a case, the test being negative does not mean that they shouldn't be quarantined for 14 days like we recommend, um, but, um, but it definitely helps to set some people's minds at ease initially. And then, um, you know, certainly there's different settings where 
individuals are at higher risk either for spread because of congregate living situation or might be at risk for higher or worse outcomes because of medical conditions or age. And so we have done a lot of screening in our long-term care facilities, for example, our jails. Um, those have definitely been settings where we maybe have screened asymptomatic people who, where we know there have been other cases to try to catch them early and be aware so that we can respond quickly if they do develop symptoms. Um, and then also helps us with cohorting and um, keeping those who aren't positive away from those who are when they may not have symptoms yet in those settings. And then um, public health surveillance. So that's, um, you've probably heard of a uh, co-immunity project and other projects in the community. Um, some of that is really just trying to understand where the spread of disease is happening. Um, and give us a heads up about, you know, are there other populations we should be looking at or testing? Um, and then certainly public health surveillance purposes, if someone has been a contact to a case, they are, um, tend to be offered testing or directed to different testing facilities in the city. And one thing I will say is we at the health department, um, we have such a outstanding community of healthcare providers that are willing to help. Um, and we have had the support from them to do testing in the community. So we did not, like many other health departments, create our own internal testing site so that we could focus more on the response part of the effort. And so just wanna say really grateful to Norton and all of the other healthcare facilities for doing um, that testing and making that available in the community. And um, I know there are some challenges at times with getting results back. I think a lot of people are thinking if they go somewhere else, they're gonna get a quicker test back because they can get a rapid test. But what I've found is, especially in the last month or so, we have pretty rapid results locally. So, um, so if you're trying to send people to other counties to get tested, it may be just as quick to send them to one of our local sites. And our health department website has um, regularly updated um, uh, testing sites on there. So if we get a new site or if an old site drops off, then we are updating that on a regular basis. So. So there was a, an article in the New York Times uh, within the last couple of weeks that pointed out the challenge in some communities um, that sites were not testing children. They don't want to test anybody under 16 or anybody under 18. Um, now, within the Norton system, of course, um, kids can be referred to the, um, the RITC. Um, physicians within the Norton system have access to testing. Um, Community sites, are community sites routinely testing children? Um, I believe they are, and I don't, I haven't heard any complaints that they aren't, but I will check on that and see if I can do a follow-up with the team so that they can get that out to you. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, we, we had a couple of questions um, from the audience. One is you, you mentioned some at-risk populations who undergo routine screening even without symptoms. As, as more schools open, are we going to see recommendations for kids who are attending in-person school just to get a test, just mm -hmm. because to make sure that they're not asymptomatically infected? I think there's different viewpoints on this. Um, one, I think the biggest risk in our school systems locally, is, especially in the public school system, is kids that may not have access to primary care showing up at school sick um, or at the bus stop sick um, or getting sick in the middle of school. And then um, they do have nurses at those schools, which is a great thing, but having the ability to actually get an answer so that one, they know how to respond within the school system and figure out who needs to be quarantined, who's been around the kid, those sorts of things. But then also to try to make sure that that child gets linked up to medical care um, where they might not have access otherwise. So I think that would be our number one priority. We're looking at some pilot testing with JCPS to see how we can do that and some grant funding. I don't know how that will pan out, but we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. And then um, I think as far as asymptomatic testing, we really have not seen um, spread, like I mentioned before, that would indicate that that's necessary across the board. Um, I know the colleges have been doing a lot of that. As you can imagine, college students' um, activities and behaviors um, around the clock are difficult to manage and monitor. And so I think that push has been 
um, reasonable, but also I'm not sure how sustainable that will be for universities across the board. And I'm guessing that many of them will go towards symptom-based testing um, and then exposure-based testing as well. But um, certainly we recognize a lot of um, different jurisdictions have focused on testing and that has actually held them up from returning people to school or limited those. So I think, again, we would want to prioritize kids who are one at high risk potentially, but then also those kids who may not have the access to care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we, we really just have one more slide. Um, and I think you addressed this question last time, but um, I still get this question. I suspect you are still getting this question. Um, be before we switch to, to primarily Q&A, you wanna talk about quarantine after exposure? Yeah, definitely. I know I mentioned already. So when someone's exposed, they should be quarantined for 14 days after their last known exposure or la after the last exposure to the person during their infectious period. So if they're a household exposure, say mom is sick and the child is exposed, when mom is released from isolation, that child's 14 day counts starting then. So that child could have been exposed any time during the parent's illness. And so, um, so that 14 day clock starts then. And unfortunately, like this can perpetuate as you can imagine if you've got five kids in a family and one gets sick one day and one gets sick three days later, yes, someone could be on quarantine for 24 days or however long. I've certainly seen that happen. Um, and then I think also to reiterate that um, a negative test doesn't mean that someone should be released from quarantine. Um, if it has not been 14 days since their last exposure, the negative test is great and very reassuring, but that is not a uh, red, you know, it's not a, you know, return, get out of jail uh, free card or return to school card. It still means that they need to quarantine. It just means so far they haven't come down with the infection. Um, and it's kind of what I would say almost like a bell shape or similar to that curve as far as when people will come down with the infection. And there are still a portion of people who will get sick towards the later part of their quarantine. So just that's the reasoning behind that. Um, it really is helpful if providers help to reinforce that um, because a lot of times the, <laughs> the families think as soon as they get a test back that's negative, they can just send their kid back to school. And then those are often the kids that a few days later are, um, are, the, are cases that were quarantining their um, nearest uh, classmates in the classroom, so. So testing after exposure, I've heard that um, uh, you don't wanna to test too soon. So day five, plus maybe day five to day 12, if you have no symptoms. Um, I, I've heard some people translate that to, okay, now I'm sick, I have COVID, um, but I shouldn't get tested until I've been sick for five days. Um, so uh, <laughs> when you get sick, you should be tested, correct? Yeah, so if you get sick, um, that you definitely, I and mean, that is certainly you want to get tested, and then that changes the whole scenario. If you're now a case, then, then we look at isolation and, and release from isolation rather than quarantine. So definitely, um, if, you're, if the contact to a case is sick, test them right off the bat. And then, yeah, there's, um, you know, we've done a few different things depending on the setting, but about three to five days is kind of the earliest that makes sense to test if someone's asymptomatic in a contact to a case. And then, you know, in, in congregate settings, we've done testing every week, uh, five to seven days until we don't see cases. Um, and that's, a, you know, obviously a special situation, but, you know, if people really want to make sure that they're negative before they go back to school, then test them on day 14 if they've remained asymptomatic. But, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to test them every day at this point, not with the, um, the, the resources that we have, unfortunately. There's people out there that say we should test everyone every day and that would be lovely, but I don't think we're quite there yet, so. So, um, you know, we um, talked a little bit about this last time and, and I think I've gotten this question several times because it really is a, a challenge for um, people on the front line. The comment is, it. It, it doesn't seem feasible in primary care peds to test all patients with all of these symptoms because we see viral GE and strep and 
um, we're going to start seeing RSV. So um, any secondary recommendations on testing sick patients without known exposure? Um, a, a, a companion question to this is some schools and daycares really want a negative test um, before they'll let a kid come back. Yeah, and we've discouraged, I think um, the state's most recent guidelines as far as return um, has really discouraged um, retesting. What we've seen is so many people are positive for so long and it doesn't necessarily mean that they are infectious still. And so they're really discouraging retesting within 90 days of the original test. There's some exceptions to that. We've seen some cases where people have developed new symptoms after they think they may have been re-exposed and that's kind of in its own unique um, scenario. But the state's recommendations are really um, pushed away from retesting in someone who we know is positive already. And the health department will release someone from quarantine, or sorry, from isolation if they are sick, um, once they meet the release from isolation criteria. So um, you can always contact us if you're not sure. Um, I did, didn't bring it or, or have it to share, but on our website, we do have like a helpline that you can call. Um, Lacuna Health is helping us with some of those calls and they would know those, um, they'd be able to check to see if your patient can be released from isolation or when they were or, or will be if they continue to do well. Um, and then I would say, I think, um, you know, I know an article I read said um, fever, <laughs> sore throat, and headache um, have been some of the more common symptoms. Uh, I don't know that the N was very high in that article to be able to say that across the board, those are things that you should consider. And I think JAMA had a recent commentary about you know, when things ended as far as flu season last year, we really didn't have enough data to be able to say, you know, definitively, if you have a positive flu test, you don't have COVID or, you know, where do you go with testing next? And I think right now we know COVID is very prevalent. So that would certainly be one of the top things that would be on my differential as far as testing first before I rule something else out. But I also know, especially with kids back in school, that we're going to see strep and viral GE and we're going to see flu um, soon as well. And so, you know, I think just continuing to monitor what those um, look like in the community and um, I think testing those that, um, that, that are most likely at the time would, would help you not have to do every test there is on every patient that comes in your office. Yeah, um, I, it's, it's good news that people no longer need to have a negative test once they've been positive. Um, so that's great news. Um, I, I think some people are struggling with the challenge, you know, once a child's sent home for any symptom, the, the uh, facility wants them to have a negative test before they come back. So that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I know with schools that has been a challenge too, just because a lot of times, I mean, I know in childcare facilities, they're not medical personnel. And so they really feel uncomfortable letting someone in. But um, I know you provided some good recommendations last time, Dr. Bryant, um, about um, allowance back in. I think KDE had provided some guidance on that, if I recall. Um, so, so we can share potentially share the, the daycare guidance again to the attendees if they'd like that. Um, um, and um, Washington University, I think, has developed some algorithms that they've used in their community about testing. But if the facility says you have to have a test, you pretty much have to have a test. Um, we had a question about our rapid test that can do flu A, B, and COVID-19 as accurate as the current gold standard RT-PCR done in the Norton healthcare environment. And I don't know about Norton. I know um, a lot of these tests are antigen tests and so may not be quite as um, sensitive or specific, but I think what we are finding is that if it's available and can be used, we at least probably have a better idea that um, that the patient is not very viremic or is at least negative that moment. So I think continuing to monitor patients if you have a negative test and you're using some of those tests, um, especially if you're using like a clinic-based um, antigen rapid test, um, 
you know, just like I have seen year after year in my flu clinic, when I see someone, I'm like, darn it, they definitely have the flu, but their test is negative, right? I'm clinically believing you've got the flu, I'm putting you on Tamiflu, but um, but it may not be until a few days later that that test is positive. So I think you just kind of have to apply that same, you know, clinical acumen to those scenarios. And obviously, unfortunately, it's now with two diseases instead of one. My, my understanding is that Norton will um, have a combo test for flu and COVID-19. 